On March 14th, two Russian Su-27s were attempting to harass an unmanned American MQ-9 Reaper drone over the Black Sea, when one of them, seemingly accidentally, crashed right into the drone's rear propeller. And practically before the Reaper even hit the water, the internet was already choosing sides, with some contending this shows just how incompetent Russian pilots are, and others all but certain that the Russian pilot crashed into the drone on purpose. So I set out to find out just how well-trained Russian fighter pilots really are, and what I learned surprised me. So let's talk about how Russian combat aviators really compare to their Western counterparts. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Now, if you follow defense news, you already know that intercepts between Russian and NATO aircraft are incredibly common all over the world, as is aggressive behavior from Russian pilots during these intercepts. We're already very accustomed to hearing American defense officials describe the behavior of Russian pilots as unsafe and unprofessional. But after that Su-27 crashed into an American drone, General Ryder took it a step further in a press conference held that same day, when he said, and I quote, this incident demonstrates a lack of competence, in addition to being unsafe and unprofessional. I've got to admit, that's the most professionally delivered burn that I've ever heard. Now, it is not at all uncommon to hear people say that Russian fighter pilots are not as well trained as their Western counterparts, particularly those from the United States. But after conspiracy theories began to surface all over the web about the Russian pilot potentially colliding with the MQ-9 on purpose so Russian vessels in the Black Sea could recover it, that question about pilot competency within the Russian armed forces became more important. Now, I want to be clear that while Russia is actively trying to recover this drone's wreckage, even if they do, it almost certainly won't be the first time they got their hands on an MQ-9. This aircraft's been in service for over two decades, and it has been shot down or crashed for other reasons over a variety of nations, including Syria, where Russian forces operate, and in Yemen and Libya, where there are forces that are friendly to Russia. So, dredging a broken Reaper up from the bottom of the Black Sea may not really be the intelligence windfall that many have made it out to be. But even if the intelligence value of taking this Reaper down was probably minimal, preventing it from continuing to gather intelligence about the conflict in Ukraine or Russian naval positions on the Black Sea could arguably be motive enough for the Russian pilots to be given the order to engage this drone in a way that allowed for plausible deniability. In other words, causing a crash seemingly by accident to avoid any kind of American retaliation. Of course, in doing so, to be clear, that would mean Russian leaders were willingly risking not only a $37 million aircraft in the midst of an ongoing war, but a valuable pilot as well. And that's a lot of risk for one dated drone. But in order to really assess the likelihood of such a conspiracy, we really need to assess just how capable Russian pilots are to determine whether or not this is the sort of thing you could even order a pilot to try to do. So I set out to put together the most thorough and objective assessment of Russian pilot training you're likely to come across on this side of a think tank. Pulling not only from publicly available data and assessments from Western experts, but also directly from statements made by Russian officials, and even a propagandist or two. And oh boy, did I find some interesting stuff. However bad you think Russian pilot training is, it's almost certainly worse. In fact, it's so bad that this is probably going to be a two-parter. What I discovered through my research is that not only are Russian pilots by and large poorly trained, but the Russian military seems to be amid a catastrophic shortage of well-trained and experienced aviators. And this does a lot more than just offer insight into the recent collision over the Black Sea. This shortage also explains a lot about the Russian performance in the skies over Ukraine to date. And further, it suggests that Russian aviation will be struggling for years to come, regardless of the outcome of this conflict. So let's dive right into the meat of this, starting with budget. Prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of last year, Russia's entire defense budget has averaged between $61 and $69 billion per year since 2014. 
During that same span of time, the U.S. Air Force's annual funding alone averaged around $193.7 billion. Depending on your source, the U.S. Air Force operates around 5,200 aircraft, and the Russian military operates around 4,200. Based on these available figures, and in very simplified terms, the budget for America's Air Force by itself averages around double that of Russia's entire military on an annual basis. But that's actually more simplified than is appropriate, because it doesn't take things like purchasing power parity or PPP into account. Now, I offer a bit more depth on a lot of this stuff in my full write-up on Sandbox News about this topic, but suffice to say that PPP is all about evening the economic playing field between different economies for comparison. Weaker economies like Russia's may have less money to pour into defense, but goods and services also cost less within those weaker economies. As one very simplified example, the U.S. government may pay a skilled carpenter, let's say, $60 to build a table, based on the standard pay for carpenters in the U.S. and the cost of goods at American stores. The Russian government, however, might pay a similarly capable carpenter a lot less to build the same table, based on a lower pay scale and the lower cost of goods at Russian stores. So let's say $30 instead. When you consider that difference and then scale it across the entirety of a nation's economy, and then juxtapose it against another nation, you get what's called a Purchasing Power Parity Conversion Index. In 2021, that conversion factor for Russia was a 27.3, basically meaning that Russia can accomplish the same by spending one American dollar as the U.S. can by spending $27.30. This is one of many important bits of context that tends to go undiscussed when people ask why the U.S. spends so much on defense as compared to global peers. So with PPP considered, Russia's defense budget of around $65 billion a year inflates to a much more respectable $193 billion or so in equivalent U.S. spending dollars. And that's just about on par with what the U.S. invests into the Air Force. But according to a 2019 Rand Corporation analysis of Russia's military called Trends in Russia's Armed Forces, an Overview of Budget and Capabilities, Russia only allocates about 10.9% of that defense budget to its air forces. And that checks out based on what we know about Russian combat doctrine and how they don't see aircraft as a power unto themselves, but really as a sort of long-range artillery for ground support. So that means that while Russia really invests only about $6.7 billion a year into its air power apparatus, when adjusted for PPP, that's the equivalent of around $21 billion per year in U.S. spending. Which, if you wanted to spread out across Russia's 4,200 aircraft, equates to around $5 million per aircraft per year, while America averages around $37.1 million per aircraft per year. Now, there's lots of variables at play there, and of course, in reality, not all of these funds in either nation go directly to aircraft operations, but this comparison still does give us an important sense of scale. And that allows us to move into the next important question here, which is how does this difference in budget manifest in actual training? Russian fixed-wing pilots usually train at the Krasnodar Higher Military Aviation School for Pilots, where in 2021 it was reported that pilots graduate and move on to their respective units after an average of around 104 hours of beginner flight training and then an additional 60 or so hours of advanced flight training. Now, this is admittedly a significant increase since the early to mid-2000s, which also happens to coincide with a significant increase in Russian defense spending at around that same time. But this average combined total of 200 or so hours in the cockpit before heading to a combat-ready unit is not a very good look compared to American standards. Fighter pilots in the U.S. Air Force start out by attending initial flight screening in Pueblo, Colorado, where they'll accumulate around 25 hours in a prop-driven aircraft like a Diamond DA-20. Then they'll go on to specialized undergraduate pilot training, or SUPT, where they'll couple more classroom instruction with around 90 more flight hours behind the stick of another prop-driven aircraft, usually a Beechcraft T-6 Texan II. Only after completing Phase 2 of SUPT, after already accumulating 115 or so flight hours, are Air Force pilots assigned the type of aircraft they'll be flying in service. 
During Phase 3, fighter and bomber pilots, which are usually made up of the top students from each class, go on to accumulate another 100 plus hours in jet-powered aircraft like the T-38 Talon. Upon completion of SUPT, Air Force fighter pilots will have already accumulated an average of some 215 to 250 hours of flying time, all before even climbing into the cockpit of their assigned combat aircraft. In fact, it's at this point, after 250 or so hours, that pilots move on to the Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals course, where they'll rack up another 20 or so hours before advancing yet again to their respective training unit to train extensively in their assigned aircraft for another six months to a year before getting a squadron assignment. As a result, Air Force fighter pilots reach their first unit with around twice the cockpit experience of their Russian counterparts on average. Obviously, there are individual exceptions on either side. But that's not the end of the training gap, it's the beginning. The next important basis for comparison is continuous seat time in the aircraft you're assigned. Just like a Navy SEAL needs to continually train on the various firearms and equipment they might leverage in a fight to consistently perform at such an elite level, pilots need to fly their planes as often as possible to accumulate experience and grow comfortable so they're prepared to do their jobs when the sky starts literally exploding all around them. According to the International Review, Russian fighter pilots average somewhere between 70 and 120 hours of flight time per year, which shakes out to about 5.8 to 10 hours in their aircraft per month. But as the International Review points out in their own report, these are the figures provided by the Russian government, and they do appear to be artificially inflated. In fact, you can even find Russian language state media outlets running stories in 2018 congratulating one fighter unit for all of its pilots what's reaching 70 hours in that year. That makes it seem like 70 hours may be on the top end rather than the bottom. Now, to be clear, American fighter pilots have struggled to log what the Air Force considers to be sufficient seat time in recent years as well, particularly since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Heritage Foundation's in-depth analysis of U.S. military power assessed that American fighter pilots across the board accumulated an average of 131 flight hours in 2020, or around 10.9 hours per month. But other outlets, like Air and Space Forces Magazine, report far worse figures, with 2020 reflecting an average of just 8.1 hours and 2021 averaging just 6.8 hours per month. So by taking the highest possible Russian training figures and comparing them to the lowest reported American ones, we can create a very Russian-friendly basis of comparison for how much cockpit time a Russian fighter pilot might have, let's say four years after arriving at their first combat unit, versus an American pilot. Under those specific circumstances, your average Russian pilot will have accumulated around 680 hours in the cockpit, whereas using the lowest reported figures, an American pilot would have closer to 726 or so hours, which, while more, isn't all that far off. But when we don't stack the deck in Russia's favor and use more realistic figures, this comparison becomes a lot more one-sided, with the Russian pilot four years after their first combat assignment accumulating around 480 total flight hours, and the the American pilot at the same point in their career closer to the 924 hour mark. In other words, it's not unreasonable to say that on average, American fighter pilots tend to have about twice the cockpit experience of their Russian counterparts. And all of this is before you consider flight time in simulators, because although both nations do employ simulators, the U.S. has invested heavily into fielding the most advanced and realistic flight simulators on the planet. In fact, you could probably buy a half dozen or more jet-powered T-38 trainer aircraft for the price of just one F-35 simulator. But being able to effectively leverage the capabilities of your aircraft in a fight is obviously about a lot more than just chalking up seat time in the cockpit. As the U.S. learned the hard way in the air battles over Vietnam, realistic combat training has a huge effect on a pilot's performance, especially the first time they find themselves in a fight. By 1969, the U.S. Navy sought to resolve this problem by establishing the Navy Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor Program, later renamed Navy Fighter Weapons School, but most of us know it as Top Gun. In 1975, the U.S. Air Force took realistic air combat training to the next level with the establishment of Red Flag, which is a massive air combat exercise that forces a variety of aircraft to coordinate with one another in a realistic setting against dissimilar aggressor aircraft with pilots trained specifically in emulating the behavior and the tactics 
of opponent nations. Today, allied nations from around the world send aviators, aircraft, and support crews to participate in Red Flag as well, ever broadening both the scale and the realism of this intense training environment. According to the U.S. Air Force, it's not uncommon for there to be more than 29 different types of American aircraft alone participating in any given red flag exercise, alongside foreign aircraft and a laundry list of ground-based defense systems and more. Both Top Gun and Red Flag have helped to reshape the way America leverages its air power, turning the largest air force in the world into arguably the most well-trained and capable to boot. But doing so isn't cheap. According to some reports, each of the three Red Flag exercises held every year costs Uncle Sam between 20 and $60 million in ordnance, operating, and personnel costs. And this is one of those places where the funding disparity between Russian and American air forces becomes perhaps most evident. As Guy Plopsky, a defense analyst who specializes in Russian military affairs, explained in a piece for Hushkit back in 2021, Russian fighter pilots do train in a variety of simulated combat scenarios, but rarely in coordination with other military assets and almost never in a truly combined arms large-scale exercise. I'll quote him here. Larger Russian Aerospace Forces exercises can include two or more different types of aircraft, including supporting platforms such as airborne early warning and control aircraft and tankers, giving crews the opportunity to practice aerial refueling and train with or against other platforms. Now, it's important to note that Russia does occasionally hold joint force training exercises that may see wider participation, but not with the scope and certainly not with the regularity of American exercises like Red Flag. And this training shortcoming creates real issues for Russian forces in a large-scale conflict like Ukraine. Which brings us to how this training disparity manifests in actual combat operations, which seems like a good place to leave off for now. Next week, we'll dive deep into the performance of Russian aircraft and air defenses throughout the past year of fighting in Ukraine, and we'll draw direct comparisons to the Gulf War air campaign of 1991. So if you understandably felt as though this overview of training budgets, policies, and methodologies was a little dry, next week will be all about combat, and that might be a bit more interesting for you. And of course, anytime we talk about the failings of the Russian military, we should expect that the comment section below this video and the next one will be absolutely flooded by Putin's fans and employees doing their level best to spread disinformation while their Kool-Aid drinkers help out with some misinformation of their own. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that anyone who disagrees with me or anything that I've said is pro-Russia. Absolutely not. But if your comment looks like it was just copied and pasted off of an English translation of the Kremlin website, well, then I'm not sure your criticism's in good faith. So if you've made it this far and you don't hate me already for being an ignorant capitalist pig, do me a favor and drop a comment down below about which Russian fighter design you can't help but think is beautiful. It'll give me something to read in between all the hate-filled messages, and let's be honest, for all of Russia's failings, they do make some pretty jets. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. I want to thank Hector Tinoco for handling editing duties on this video. And make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.